Perhaps in every other game that you play, your opponents are trying to pin your knights this way. And for this video, I've analyzed a bunch of games of none other than Magnus Carlsen trying to see how he handles such situations. And I've discovered that he always uses four specific ways, four specific ideas to either counter the pin and punish his opponent for this attempt, or to make use of the pin himself successfully. The first position is pretty complex, Carlsen is playing white against Stalker playing black. It is white to play. Now, you may think about this yourself for a second. How would you play here if you were white? Now, in this position we can see mutual pins, actually. So first of all, this knight is pinned down to the pawn on g7. So the knight cannot move, because if black ever moves the knight anywhere, it doesn't matter. That will lead to queen takes g7 checkmate. On the other hand, black is also trying to pin the rook this way. So if the rook moves, black wants to trade off queens and then to win this knight on e3. Therefore, it's quite funny that both players are trying to make use of paint. Now, what do you do here? I'm pretty sure that most players would probably just take this pawn on g7 right here, and that would be a wrong move to play, because of the rule number one. And the rule number one states, increase, don't release. What I mean by that is, if there is a pinned piece, and if there is a pin in a position, you want to increase the pressure, and you do not want to release the pressure, you don't want to trade off and eliminate the pin. Because if white were to take over here, like, yeah, you grabbed a pawn, perhaps it's bad for black to take it, that would expose the king, however, there is no pin anymore, right, because of this pin, if, of this pawn, so the knight is now free to go, black can play something like rook d8, initiate a bunch of exchanges, and the game goes on. Once again, you don't want to release the pressure, you want to increase the pressure on the pinned piece. So Carlson asked himself, how can I attack this knight from g6 and try to remove it? And he found an interesting maneuver, starting off with knight to d5, chasing away this queen, while simultaneously, you know, removing the problem of this pin. Uh, the queen after that went to a7, and now knight to e7, white is actively trying to get rid of this knight, that is also a check to the king, by the way, and the problem for black is they can't get rid of this annoying knight because, you know, the knight is pinned, that will lead to an instant checkmate. Therefore, black didn't play that move, and after knight to e7 check, he instead played king to h7. However, they now have to tolerate this annoying knight right in the center of their own position, which controls a bunch of squares. And here, Carlson noticed that there is another tactical pattern now. Rook d5 threatens this checkmate, rook takes h5. Therefore, black played pawn takes here, trying to provide some escape square. Rook takes h5, check to the king, king goes here, knight f5, king to g8. After some back and forth things, you know, the knight is pinned yet again. What do you do then? You increase the pressure on the pinned knight. And so, Carlson just played rook h6. With an intent either to play h5 and just win the knight that way because it's pinned, or maybe even to sacrifice the knight, uh, the rook at some point and try to get to the king. So black saw that this h5 is a big problem that's coming because there's not much they can do. Therefore, they tried to seek some counterplay and he played pawn e3. Moreover, after white took it with a pawn, black even sacked the bishop and after that black rook played rook to e8. It's quite funny that for the second time in a row, both players are trying to make use of a pin. So black is trying to win the knight over this pin and white is trying to make use of this pin also over a knight on g6. So let's see how Carlsen handles this. Well, first he's gotta address this instant threat of rook takes e3 because that's quite a big problem that would attack the queen and king. So he played rook h3 just to protect this knight. However, black pushed forward with hf5. And now the situation gets really tricky, because they both are actually aiming for the same thing. Black wants to play f4 and win this knight on e3, because it is pinned. And white basically wants the same, he wants to play h5 and win this knight on g6, because it is also pinned. Here's the second idea from Magnus Carlsen. I studied a lot of games where his pieces were pinned and I tried to notice what is different with Magnus Carlsen compared to the rest of the gang. So, for us male models, when we see a situation like that, when your opponent is trying to make use of the pin, we instinctively want to somehow get rid of this annoying situation. So we want to play a bishop e2, you know, and maybe cover it, or maybe we want to move the king away of this dangerous file. So we want to do something like this. The problem, however, is that these moves are passive, a little bit awkward, and your opponent can keep attacking. So Carlson used another approach, which I call for myself ignore and amplify. So he often just ignored anything that his opponent is trying to do and instead said, you know what, I'm going to double down on my own attack and this will automatically force you to forget about whatever his opponent intended to do. So Carlson just played h5, completely ignoring the fact that black could play f4 and black did. However, now he played a truly brilliant move. You may try to think about this for a few seconds to guess it yourself, but it's really, really 
gr brilliant idea. Now, it has to do something pretty quick, because the queen is attacked, as well as this knight, many times, and he played rook to h8. Quite an unusual sacrifice of the rook from h6, which was kind of locked there in the corner of the board. And now it turns out that black can't take it with the knight because it's pinned, right? So he probably needs to take it with the king, which he did on the next move, though. The point is, if black took here, that would allow white to play pawn takes g6 with check. That's what white tried to achieve by sacrificing the rook here. He wanted to win a tempo. And after the king goes somewhere, now it can once again deliver this check, which is a double check. So the king has to go, and now white has a very pleasant choice. He can play queen takes a 4 which will solve the problem of black's attack very elegantly, because white will just take it away and deliver a check. That's what we talked about before. When you ignore an amplifier, quite often you can solve the problem of your defense automatically. Or even stronger, you can start off with rook to h7, which also skews here the queen. And then on the next move, maybe queen takes a 4 you eliminate this pawn, check again. Then you eliminate the queen, and like you completely destroy black's attack while just seemingly making no defensive moves at all. In the game, Black figured it out, but the finish of the game was still pretty beautiful. He played King G7, but Carlson didn't stop bothering Black and just played Rook H7, saying, you know what, let's get into the same thing you take, and I take here with check. Black tried to escape on F6, but Carlson this time made the other pin. He made use of the other pin. Queen takes G6, came out of nowhere, and it turns out that this pawn is also pinned all of a sudden. <laughs> Quite funny that in this game everything was pinning everything. After a pawn takes and rook takes a7, white is just having so much material advantage that black just resigned. In the next game, Carlson is playing white against bay, and so far it's been pretty standard development. Now, here Carlson noticed that there is a pin on the knight. However, you can also notice that it is a very temporary situation, because black intends to play probably bishop g7 and then a castle, walking away from this pin from the bishop. Therefore, if white wants to take advantage of the pin, they gotta do it right away. And here comes the third big idea from Magnus Carlsen. If there is a pin, yes, you wanna attack the pinned piece, you wanna pile up on it, however, what also is important is to attack right away and to use force in moves. So he played d4, threatening either to push or to take. Either way, he's making use of this pin. Therefore, black has no time for bishop g7, he's gotta do something about it, and he just took here on d4. Moreover, at this point, Carlsen didn't just recapture, which probably would be the move that most players would play, because after that, black would probably play bishop d7 to protect this knight, and then it's not that clear how white can continue his attack. So let's take it back. Instead, Carlsen decided to break open the center with the move pawn e5. Now, the knight is still pinned, therefore can't move, black has to capture with a pawn, and now after knight takes e5, this attack is getting real, so knight takes c6 is a real threat. Black try to play queen d5, trying to attack, you know, these both minor pieces as well as to defend this knight on c6. And remember the previous idea? Increase, don't release. Many players in such positions just automatically try to trade on c6. But the big idea of this pin thing here is you don't want to just sell out. You don't want to get out of business. You know, you want to exit the business when you're ready to grab a big chunk of the pie and enjoy your life on Bahamas. So you don't take until you are ready to get something really valuable after that. So Carlson just increased the pressure by playing rook e1, adding pressure along the e-file and getting ready to, you know, jump with his knight somewhere with this discovered check. Therefore, like cover the king with bishop e6. And now Carlson found another interesting idea. He first traded on c6 and then played knight c3. Quite a beautiful stuff right here. Now, the queen is attacked, and it turns out that taking the knight is not a good thing for black. He actually moved the queen away, because if black took the knight, then after queen takes d5, it's an interesting thing that, although black has a lot of materials standing right here, but the pawn is pinned down to the king, so is the bishop, and therefore the only piece that can actually take the queen would be the knight from here, but now bishop takes c6 comes with a double attack to the king and rook, that's why it would win material and get a winning position. That's why in the game black just played queen to c5, still it feels like black is attacking a bunch of pieces, however Carlson found one more pin, he played queen to f3. This time not only it attacks this pawn on c6, but also it's actually pinned down to the rook, therefore black can't take the, the bishop. Similarly, he's got to address the threat of bishop takes c6, because from there it's going to be a double attack of the king and rook. Therefore, black played king to d7. But now, this knight on f6 is actually hanging, so white just took it. 
This also attacks the rook right here, like defended, and Carlson played another counter-attacking move, knight to e4. Offense is the best defense, so black is attacking here, white is attacking the queen as well. Queen takes b5, and now the queen can move away comfortably, queen takes d4, delivering check to the king. Black tries to cover, and now queen to c3. Now, after the dust settles, we can see that black managed to save his material, however, the king is now deadly exposed right in the middle of the board. Black played rook to b8, and finally here comes the final pin that white is taking advantage of. He goes bishop g5, clearing path for the rook, so that on the next move he goes rook d1, and this time the queen is pinned, and black has to give up something. So black decided to move the bishop away, he can't save the queen anyway, and now, once again, to take is a mistake, the coronation knows it, right? So don't take here, increase, don't release. Now the queen cannot move away because it's pinned down to the king. Therefore, white just can play whatever he wants. So knight of six, white is bringing the queen closer, and then after a couple moves, I'll just show them real quick, black tried king c8, trying to escape, this time white has to take the queen, otherwise it is ready to move. And finally, white finished the game with the final little combo. Rook takes e6, sacrifice the rook, followed by queen to f8. With this discovered, not discovered, but just a double check, and white wins the game. And this example is absolutely hilarious. I had a lot of fun finding it, so I do hope that you are going to enjoy it as well. Carlson's played white, and it is white to move. Now, what would you play here? I hope that by now you understand that taking on g7 is not a good idea because you want to increase, don't release the pressure. Now, in this case, it is a slightly unusual pin because the rook is pinned down to this rather square on h8. So, theoretically, there is nothing there, but if the rook moves, let's say I'll play some move for white just to illustrate the point, let's say if the, if the rook moves, like, that leads to this queen h8 checkmate, and for that reason the rook cannot move. So that would allow this queen h8 thing, as well as maybe queen takes g6 in some lines. So the rook has to stay there, and therefore it is pinned. Now, ideally speaking, let's move the king back. All right, now it's white to move. Ideally speaking, white would love to play bishop d5 check. However, now it does not win the game because black would just play e6 and block the diagonal. So if you want to increase the pressure, you need to somehow prepare this move. And therefore, Carlson played rook e1, getting ready to play bishop d5 on the next move. Black naturally tried to stop it by going e6, but now Carlson once again used the other rule that we talked about, using force and moves. We know that a pin is a temporary situation that you want to make use of right away, and ideally you want to use force and moves, because then your opponent has no time to do anything else. Now, so he just sacrificed the rook just for one pawn, with the whole purpose of putting the other pin right here. That's absolutely hilarious. You're sacrificing a rook for a pawn just for a sake of one pin. There's also an interesting point right here. Um, like, there are two types of pins. One is a relative pin, kind of like with this rook, where a piece can theoretically move even though there is a certain downside of that. But there is also an absolute pin, it is when a piece is pinned down to the king, and then the piece, this knight, cannot move at all, it's just against the rules of chess. And those absolute pins are the deadliest, because your pawn literally has no way of getting out of them, and so that really puts black in trouble. Black played rook to e8, and at this point that was the funniest move ever <laughs> that wins the game. Uh, now, it's funny because although white is putting significant pressure right here, but black is holding, and there is no easy way for white to somehow break through. And so white wins the game by playing pawn to c7. It's absolutely ridiculous. I mean, this pawn is deeply into black's territory, and there are seemingly like so many of the black pieces standing right there, they control these squares, but all these pieces are so busy and they're pinned so badly that they cannot stop this little pawn from moving forward. Like, that is absolutely hilarious. It's the only time I've seen anything like that. Moreover, uh, the black player, Ponomorov, was actually at some point the FIDE world champion, so I would say that that is really the pin of shape. Now, what can black do? I mean, the pawn just keeps marching forward. And then, you want to distract the rook and play bishop takes e6. And if black actually captures the pawn, then it allows us to play queen h8. Check to the king, the king has to go, and as you slide back, once again black suffers for this pin. Black would love to move the knight back to g7, but they can't, because it's pinned. So they have to play queen g7, but even that doesn't help, because after white simply captures it, black still can't move the knight, so it's just a checkmate. And that is another amazing example. It is white to play and win. Now, at first it looks like black is winning because of this pin, and your task is to find the way out. If you can't find it, please write it down in the comments below. You will be rejoiced, it's a really phenomenal stuff. Now, if you can't find it, don't be discouraged, it's quite an advanced stuff. 
just go to the comments and we have a lot of advanced players, somebody will post the right solution. While knowing how to handle pins is an important subject, of course it's just one component. If you want to have a comprehensive guide and get everything that you need to reach the level of 2000 in chess, I've put together a dedicated bundle that contains literally everything that you need step by step to get to that level. It's been proven and tested by thousands of students by now and if you want to join the GAN, check out the link in the description below. If you want me to cover certain specific openings in my next videos, let me know in the comments below and have fun, take care.